Yeah, uh, almost any angle from which you approach Europe turns out to be a mess. They have really screwed things up. Not that we haven't, but uh, Europe's story is particularly interesting because so much of it was pretty easily predictable. Um, let, let's go back to um, the, the decades after World War II to, for, the, for the beginning of this story. And, and uh, most of the European countries then set up very generous entitlement systems. In other words, um, universal health care and uh, versions of what we would call social security, you know, retirement benefits um, that uh, basically gave somebody who spent a lifetime working and paying taxes and uh, following the rules a, um, a reasonably um, stress-free retirement. Okay. In other words, generous enough to take care of that. Uh, but they didn't put any money away to pay for future obligations. They just set up pay-as-you-go systems so that each year's retirement benefits and health care entitlements came out of current tax revenues. Um, the problem with that is that the baby boomer generation who uh, you know, were born after World War II, um, that's the biggest generation in most modern countries and when we i'm a baby boomer when we start to retire the costs of these programs go through the roof and so europe never put anything away for this they don't have any trust funds or any dedicated accounts that they can draw on unfunded so, liability right um would yeah, it be if, considered if that would, um see that's what we have in the u.s because we're lying about our expenses you know we we have this separate category category called unfunded liabilities that uh, that we report but we don't include in the deficit or the national debt figures and in europe um i guess you could say they're a little more honest about it because they don't even bother with stuff like that they just um, they just have this expense each year <laughs> and the expense is going way up so you can run the numbers and, and some people have and uh, and, and call it an unfunded liability, but basically, um, it it it's huge. You know, whoever runs the numbers comes up with some astoundingly large number in the multi multi trillion euro dollar range. And so, going forward, they're going to be bankrupted by this. Just this alone, you know, just this problem right here would basically destroy the eurozone as we know it. Uh, but that's just one of their many problems. You know, they, they've got this demographic issue, obviously, which feeds into the, uh, um, the the problem with their retirement programs because they're getting older and there are fewer and fewer young people coming along to work hard, pay lots of taxes and, and take care of their parents and grandparents. And so there's this wall out there that will bankrupt them, basically. You know, they'll just hit a point where they can't raise taxes anymore because beyond a certain point, raising taxes um, is a negative sum game. You know, you take away X number of euros from the average working person, or you try to, and you actually end up getting a, a much, much smaller number. You get up, you get less than you would have gotten if you hadn't raised taxes because people stop working or they uh, they can't pay their own bills and they go bankrupt or whatever. You know, you you end up um, destroying the wealth creation mechanism of capitalism beyond a certain point in tax levels. And Europe is there now, you know, so they're, they're really regressing economically. They're getting poorer instead of richer when they need to get much, much richer in order to cover their obligations. John, so, let me let, let me jump in right there. So it kind of leads into my kind of what did I wanted to talk about next, which is, you know, the immigration issue that we're seeing in Europe. And you kind of talked about not having enough workers to pay for all the retirees and uh, there's this idea that if we have more people come into this country immigrants will have more workers and this will fix the income the tax revenue problem because you'll have more workers in the system but does importing a bunch of poor people into a country actually make and give the situation a positive result well it depends on who the people are 
And, you know, this, this is kind of a, a very uncomfortable conversation for most people to have, and I'm going to skirt around it. <laughs> but basically, uh, you know, the, the U.S. early on, we, we had massive immigration, but it was mostly Europeans coming in and, and some Chinese who are culturally very compatible with the U.S. as it was configured then. You know, they came in, they worked hard, they assimilated, and two generations later, they were basically Americans, indistinguishable from anybody else. You know, my, my Italian ancestors were like that. My grandparents never really learned to speak English, but my brother and sister and I are completely American. We don't even think of ourselves as Italian anymore, you know, so we fit right in eventually, a couple of generations later. And um, what Europe tried uh, you know, they, they basically tried the same thing by importing lots of relatively young people. They thought, well, we'll have workers who are going to, you know, come here and pay lots of taxes for the next 30 years. And that's how we'll get around this demographic entitlements issue that is going to destroy us otherwise. But they, they basically opened the floodgates to... Um, people from the Middle East and Africa who aren't assimilating for whatever reason, you know, it's just not working. And so it's causing more problems than it fixes. And so they're still left with this demographic issue that is going to blow up in their faces very, very soon. I mean, the, um, the, the increase in expense as baby boomers retire is absolutely debilitating for most of these countries. And so you, you could say, uh, you know, looking at their books honestly, that they're already functionally bankrupt. Even somebody like Germany, you know, a, a country that most people consider to be just firing on all cylinders, the success story of the global economy, is only that if you ignore the unfunded liabilities of all their um, entitlement plans. And if you include them, you know, the, the, their government finances just cra crater, you know, they, they look horrible yeah. and unsustainable. Are we and seeing the immigrants become uh, an entitlement burden on the European society yet uh, or, yeah. or likely to be a burden in the future? Well, in, in the short run. Um, a big influx of immigrants costs money rather than makes money because you've got to set up infrastructure for them. You know, you've got to build schools to educate their kids and hospitals to um, to give them health care. And at first, no matter who they are, at first, they're not generating enough wealth to cover that expense. So it's an investment at first. And for the investment to pay off, those people have to settle in, assimilate, and um, and basically become working class citizens of whatever country that we're talking about. You know, they've got to work very, very hard for a relatively meager return in the interest of building something for their family in the future. You know, you basically sacrifice a generation when you have a big influx or when you're an immigrant. You know, you, you go there not thinking that you're going to have this nice cushy life. You go there and you intend to work your butt off for your lifetime so that your kids don't have to do that. Mm. You know, that's the thought process and the attitude of immigrants as we know them in the ideal sense. Yeah. Okay? You, you know, know and, our, and our ancestors did that. that that's, a, that's a really good point. But I guess the what I would say the flip side of that is it's their life is so bad where it is that they – going to wherever it is they're going to go they're going to have a better life than where they were so there is some upside for the person who's sacrificing their life to move to yeah. a better place or at least a, a better future yeah you know if somebody came here from um, you know 1925 europe yeah, it's true. They're, they're working really hard every single day, but their life is still better than it was yeah. back there because because they have a trajectory. Right. That work actually feeds into a process that builds a future. Whereas in in a lot of places around the world, you know, you work hard every day just to to eat, and your life doesn't get any better. And here, um, you know, the American dream was that um, hard work and um, and staying out of trouble and obeying the rules 
because they were reasonable rules, um, led to something much better for you and your family. And, and you know, it's, it's arguably not the case, at least in the minds of a lot of immigrants into the, uh, the developed world now, because we don't have the bottom few rungs on the economic ladder like we used to. You know, it, could, it used to be that you could go show up at a factory and they would take you on. And in four or five years, you're you're unionized and you're you're making you know lower middle class money. Boom, just like that. And there's nothing like that anymore. <laughs> Here, you know, in the U.S. now, you become an Uber driver or something like that with no benefits and and just enough money to pay your bills, not enough to support your family. And that's basically it. So this 4.9 unemployment rate in the U.S. is a, is a cruel joke. Um, but in, in Europe, to go back to that theme, um, what's happening now is a, a lot of the people from the, uh, the Middle East and Africa are, are choosing to keep their previous culture and just try to transplant it into Europe. So you've got basically uh, the beginnings of a civil war now where these, these African and Middle Eastern cultures are incompatible with the extremely socially and economically liberal ethos that, that dominates Europe right now. And so these guys really aren't sure what to do, because on the one hand, you've got um, you've got an institutionalized multiculturalism in which it's literally a crime to criticize someone else's religion, especially if it's a religion from the developing world or the culture, a culture from the developing world. You literally go to jail for hate speech in countries like Italy for something like that. And I think France. And so the fact that the cultures that are coming in are, are turning out not to be compatible with the existing dominant culture um, is presenting these guys with a real problem, because how do you discuss it? in an environment where honestly discussing it is defined as a crime in a lot of places. And, and so that's leading to the rise of political parties of both the right and the left that used to be considered on way out on the fringe and very extreme, now getting a lot of votes because they're the ones who are willing to say what needs to be said or what they perceive needs to be said and what a lot of voters perceive needs to be said. So you've got National Front in France, which is a you know formerly neo-Nazi party that has cleaned up its act to an extent and is now an anti-immigration party, and they're the biggest vote getter wow. in France. And UKIP in Great Britain is now leading the Brexit charge. You know they're they're the uh, the main impetus behind the referendum that's coming up pretty soon in Great Britain about maybe leaving the European Union and immigration is the main issue there because if they leave the European Union they get to control their borders again and they, they don't have to be at the mercy of you know mm -hmm. 10 million people coming in from Syria or wherever and tramping across Europe and, and going across the channel and showing up at Britain, in Britain and then automatically qualifying for all kinds of government benefits. Here, you know, let's right stop, now we're at the mercy of that. Let's stop right there because I did want to talk about uh, this Brexit, the British exit, Britain's exit here for a little bit and you touched on it, which, uh, yeah, you know, so we're seeing it be an origination from the immigration is does it have anything to do with the British economy being better than the other countries in Europe or is it simply the immigration issue well immigration is an issue for everybody in Europe and you're seeing all kinds of different responses to it you know they're building fences around their countries and they're trying to suspend the uh, the the eurozone rule or the european union rule that allows free movement of people across borders so it's a problem for everybody but uh, britain has a bit of an advantage because they never joined the euro in the first place so they aren't suffering from the fatal flaws of the common currency as it was originally envisioned and implemented and um, so that's a, that's a whole different problem. I mean, to even do away with the whole immigration thing. And Europe still has a fundamental monetary problem that they're not really addre addressing, which is that the, uh, the euro is a currency 
that ha operates with a common monetary policy that's mostly dictated by Germany. And what makes Germany comfortable is existentially threatening to Italy and Spain and Greece and Portugal. You know, those countries can't operate under a monetary regime that makes Germans happy and vice versa. And, you know, if you, uh, if you create a euro that you're actively aggressively inflating away, which is what the Italians and the Spain and the Spaniards would really like, then uh, Germany, which went through a hyperinflation within living memory, is terrified by what they see happening. And they don't, they're not going to let that happen, you know? So, so these guys have some fundamental problems of, of a monetary nature that, that, that are also existentially threatening to the system as it now exists. So, um, as I said, how, however you approach Europe, whatever angle you want to analyze them from, um, they've got existentially threatening problems now. And uh, the, the monetary problem is one, but you know, Britain at least, um, at least avoided that by not joining the Eurozone. You know, there, there's a great video of Margaret Thatcher in um, the, the 1990s debating this issue in the House of Commons, and she just shreds it, you know, and then she looks really prescient and really brilliant. And it's easy to see why she was the, the towering figure that she was back then, when you see how she anticipated the problems that would flow from uh, Britain trying to completely integrate itself into Europe and, and basically put itself under the power of bureaucrats in Brussels and monetary authorities that uh, that stand above the Bank of England. You know, she, she wasn't having any of that back then. And she turned out to be right. So, so now Britain is debating whether they want to keep even the membership in the European Union, you know. Who and suffers? it's a close bet right now. Who suffers if they do leave? And who would be the benefactor? Well, that's, that's the question. Nobody's tried to do this yet. And they're really, from a regulatory standpoint, deeply intertwined with the European Union, you know, their, their businesses operate on the continent under a set of rules that they've accepted and internalized now. And when they leave, a different set of rules apply to them. So they're, they're and, and then there are Brit British expats living in Europe who operate, you know, live now under a certain set of rules. Those rules might change in the future if uh, Britain is no longer part of the EU. You know, those expats living in Europe won't be EU citizens anymore. So um, there, there's the potential for a lot of turmoil on the way, you know, from here to whatever comes next. But I think in the end, you know, it's doable because lots of countries operate just fine outside of the EU while they still do a lot of business with the EU. You know, they still operate with, um, you know, big trading um, companies there and, and, and you know, they, they, they get along just fine with the Eurozone and, um, and the European Union. And so eventually Britain could be one of those countries and then get along just fine too. You know, it, it could work, but there's turmoil on the way and nobody really knows exactly what the nature of the turmoil will be or how serious it is. So that's the thing that they're wrestling with. They, they see there are some dysfunctional parts of the European Union that they'd like to do away with. And they're not sure how big a leap into the abyss it would be to actually leave the Eurozone. So um, that's the debate that's going on now. And unfortunately, you can't know the answers to these questions um, except in retrospect, you got to do it before you find out what it means. And so uh, right now, the vote looks pretty close to 50-50. It's, it's uh, not a done deal either way. And the, um, the debate is ongoing. And it's really interesting because either way, it sets a precedent. And it, um, it, it creates a partial roadmap for other countries who have similar problems and are looking for viable solutions. So, you know, there's no way to tell, but uh, you know, it's going to add to the turmoil in the global financial markets either way, because if Britain stays, they've got all these same problems that are going to come to a head pretty soon. And if they leave, they've got a whole different set of issues to work through either way. Um, 
we're looking at extreme volatility in the global financial markets going forward and there's no way around that because um, you know the amount of debt that we've taken on guarantees you know bakes a crisis into the cake and that's that's our cake that's our dinner for the next few years where we've got to figure out um, how we fix these fundamentally unfixable problems you know we're just going to have to go through some kind of a big crisis to uh, to hopefully come out the other end but there's no you know there's no guarantee here we've never been in a situation where there's this much debt in the world and every single major country has an unlimited monetary printing press and is totally willing to use it uh, to do experimental things john you know talking about debt here I wanted to ask you this question. You know, we got Obama ending his term here, and uh, do you think, with the U.S. just over nineteen trillion dollars in debt, do you think we'll be at twenty trillion by the end of the year? And I ask you this because, I mean, the, they say the official deficit is about a half trillion dollars, but we've seen the the official national debt spike dramatically out of nowhere. I mean, even last year in November, we saw the debt spike $339 billion day one after the the debt ceiling was lifted. So um, I, I just, I'm just want to get your thoughts on, do you think, kind of like a, a fun guess, do you think we're going to be over $20 trillion by in, end year? Um, I don't know. The U.S. debt will continue to go up, but the official debt is such a fraud that it's almost not even worth thinking about because, as, as we talked about earlier, uh, the real debt in the U.S. has to include these unfunded liabilities, and they're three or four or five times the size of the officially reported national debt. And then private sector debt is, is going up again. And you really have to include that in any measure of a country's debt because it's all the same thing. You know, you you and I owe our share of the the treasury bonds that are outstanding, right? We got to pay the interest on that. Mm -hmm. But we also owe our mortgages and our credit cards. And we owe the unfunded liabilities for Medicare that that are out there um, where the promises are really unbreakable. You know, go ahead and try to take health care benefits away from the baby boomer generation. You know, we are the most selfish generation that's ever existed. We've always done what's best for ourselves. And, you know, if you millennials or Gen Xers or whoever try to take away our benefits, we will crush you. (laughs) (laughs) And, And, you know, we'll elect somebody who will put all those benefits back and give us more benefits. And uh, so those are those are just as real obligations as our interest on on treasury bonds or whatever Mm. and so you got to lump all that into the national debt and then if you do that you get a hundred and some trillion dollars okay way way more than the 17 18 trillion that that we have officially reported and then you got to look at derivatives which also don't they don't appear in any debt measurement but they're a huge obligation you know there's a quadrillion dollars or going on a quadrillion dollars of notional derivatives out there which are basically bets placed by big banks and hedge funds among themselves um, on movements in interest rates or credit defaults or whatever and they don't show up anywhere but they're a real obligation because if um, if some of them go bad, many of them will go bad. And then this uh, this notional value of a quadrillion dollars of liability will turn into a real value of pretty close to that. You know, that almost happened in 2008, 2009, except that the government came in and bailed out some of the big derivatives players. If they, the government hadn't done that, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and many, many other big finance companies would be gone now. Yeah, and we're dependent we on a rising that. market to keep we those going. We're dependent on a rising market to keep those oh, we, going. We totally are. You know, let let there be another serious crack in the stock market. You know, we we can't um, survive another two thousand eight, two thousand nine, uh, fifty, sixty percent drop in stock prices because we've already taken on. Um, 60 trillion dollars in official debt since that time in order to deal with that crisis 
uh, plus another hundred and some trillion in this uh, unofficial debt that we've been talking about. So we're so deeply indebted now that uh, another bailout of that magnitude is probably just physically and financially impossible. So the next one is going to be an existential threat to the global financial system on a scale that uh, that even 2009 was not. And, uh, and it's coming. I mean, you, you don't go eight, nine, 10 years without some kind of a serious bear market. And we've already gone. What, what's it been now? Again, seven, eight years yeah. that the, so this bull market has been nine, I guess. Yeah, seven yeah. years for the bull market. Yeah, and so so that's um, that's usually the lifespan of a bull market. And uh, by every measure, you know, if you look at um, equity market capitalization to GDP, which is a, a pretty good indicator of future stock market returns and the, the propensity for a crash out there. We're at um, among the highest levels ever. You know, we're second right now only to 1999, 2000 when tech stocks had gone so insane. Mm. Uh, so historical measures of equity valuations say that we're either going to have a crash or a period of extremely low returns that just drags on for a really long time. Either way, um, that's an existential threat to the global financial system. And, well, uh, yeah. well, John, I just I want to get your final uh, concluding thoughts here. But uh, I, I read this off of one of one of your posts and it, and it said that the inevitable is now imminent. And for years now, we've been hearing that just because something is inevitable does not mean it's imminent. And uh, now it's imminent. So your final thoughts here as we conclude this interview. Yeah, I, I took that from uh, Sprott Asset Management's, Management's Rick Rule, who, who has said that a few times. And I always thought it was a great phrase. And, and it is that you, you don't want to mix up inevitable and imminent because when you're investing, timing is so important. Just because something bad is gonna happen way out there or something good is gonna happen way out there, don't place your bet on it unless it, it's gonna happen shortly. And um, that was a big mistake that a lot of people made over the last few years. You know, they loaded up on gold because gold was gonna go through the roof and they, they shorted the stock market, which I, I did a couple of times there before these measures of equity overvaluation got to a, a critical point. Well, now they're at a critical point. You know, now, now they're at the point where, based on history, we don't have five more years of this. We've got a year at the most or some months or something before, before something comes along to change the, uh, the, the, the gestalt out there, you know, the, the sense of where we are and where we're headed. And so I, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, that what has been inevitable for quite a while is now imminent. Mm. And uh, that doesn't mean next week, but it probably means sometime in 2016, 2017, we get another crisis. And, uh, and this one is gonna be just insanely scary because of all the stuff we talked about here today.